Let's take a moment to take a look at some of the different topologies we've got available here. Uh, for starters, at the top, you see a simple site-to-site -site connection. This is, I think, the kind of the, the starting point for understanding VPN topologies. Uh, it's nice because when you look at this, you, you typically have uh, fixed addresses and ideally non-overlapping. So let's say 10.1.1.0 at slash 24 is what we've got at site A internally. And maybe we've got 10.2.2.0 slash 24, uh, and this is internal for site B. So we've got very clean, very obvious uh, separate networks here. And what we would effectively do is build policies on both sides that say, hey, when you see traffic coming from 10.1.1.0, going to 10.2.2.0, wrap it up, encrypt it, protect it, and send it to the public interface of the other side. And of course, at the other side, we say, uh, when you see traffic from 10.2.2.0 to trying to get to 10.1.1.0, treat it differently, go ahead and encrypt it, and send it to the outside uh, of the other site. So we point to that public IP address. So we tend to have static public IPs on the outside. We tend to have uh, private networks internally. And then we provide access between the two networks. Uh, the configurations that you'll use here, uh, things like your ISA camp policies, your transform sets, uh, crypto ACLs, paying attention to your routing functions, this is a fantastic place to kind of cut your teeth on, on IPsec and, and VPN logic. Once you can make sense of the site-to-site -site tunnels, well, then we can start to support things like Hub and Spoke. Hub and Spoke, we've got you know, perhaps many branch offices, uh, and they may all connect into the hub. This can work in scenarios where all of our resources are stored at the hub, maybe a central database or uh, mission critical application, and all the branch offices would access it across these connections. And then potentially, we could allow for spoke-to-spoke -spoke communication. Now, the communication is going to pivot through the hub. It's going to uh, have to be decrypted on that outside interface and re-encrypted on the outside interface. Not the most efficient way to pass traffic, but we could allow spoke-to-spoke -spoke communications. Uh, if you have a lot of spoke-to-spoke -spoke communications and you want it to happen leveraging the lowest latency and the most efficient use of bandwidth, we can use what's called a full mesh. And this is where every site connects to every other site. Of course, the downside is when I bring one other site online, I've got to update all the other sites that are out there. Uh, we've got some technologies like DMVPN that'll help us implement, uh, implement full mesh solutions and make it a lot less labor intensive to manage. But for starters, I would know site to site, hub and spoke, and then full mesh. And then realize as we, as we progress, we'll do um, kind of like mix-ups of these. You know, if you look at that hub and spoke, you might see that hub and say, oh, that's a single point of failure. Well, of course, we can do dual hubs. So you still don't have uh, the requirements of a full mesh. If you bring a new site online, you have to register with two, two hubs uh, opposed to all those spokes, but it does give you some resiliency. So for starters, just understand the site-to-site the -site hub and spoke and full mesh and realize that we'll do hybrids and mix-ups of some of these as we progress. Also realize that this is relevant to site-to-site -to -site connections, not necessarily remote access connections. Those have a little bit more going on. So when we look at site-to-site, -site, one of the things I mentioned on the last slide was resiliency. What happens when a device fails? Uh, what happens when the network fails? Maybe your upstream provider, uh, they've just got issues in one of their switches, so our traffic isn't making it past that particular service provider. Uh, again, like we said in a dual, uh, dual hub scenario, what happens if that device that we're leveraging as the hub goes down? Well, all of our spokes are going to be offline. Additionally, do each of those spokes have redundant internet connections? A lot of times what, what I'll do is use uh, broadband, like Fios, if we've got that available, and then I'll use a cable modem as a backup. And then if I can't get both of those, and maybe there's not DSL or some other uh, capability available, remember that we can go out over 4G or 5G, whatever is available in your city. So a lot of times we'll use the wired connection first, monitor that connection, and if there's too high of latency or too much packet loss, if the quality deteriorates, in addition to totally failing, if it just becomes kind of a crummy link, we can select an alternative path. And when we do so, we can have our VPN topology follow that. Um, because VPNs rely on intermittent networks, you can change from one to the other. And so long as you have internet access, you're going to be able to reestablish connectivity between your spokes and the hub. So this is kind of fun. What they show here is that they fixed some of the previous solutions. Notice uh, at the top, we've added a redundant device. You can do this. So we've got a pair of devices, maybe using HSRP or VRRP. 
as their first hop redundancy protocols. If one goes down, the other one takes over. You can leverage technologies such as IPSLA to monitor the quality of these particular links. And if one of the links doesn't look good, we can degrade it and we can pivot to a separate path or even a separate device. So when we build site-to-site -site VPNs, realize that we're connecting sites uh, together in a way that we've done for many, many years and what we called the, the traditional wide area network or classic WAN. Uh, in the old days, we might use a T1 or T3 circuit or for those of you in Europe, maybe like an E1 or E3. And what we're doing is leasing that dedicated copper pair between two sites, or maybe it's a fiber connection. You've leased some fiber between two offices. You can still buy dark fiber today and, and light it up yourself, and you say this is our dedicated path between two sites, but it tends to be pretty expensive. IPsec is free, it just runs on top of our existing internet connection. So if we've got a flat fee for unlimited internet access, at least around Tampa, Florida, you might be paying about 100 bucks a month for that, and you know, maybe you'll get 500 megabits down or so, uh, ideally symmetric, just depends on your location. We take that fast broadband connection and we just lay our IPsec connection on top of it. Now for some of you, maybe you're connecting hospitals, maybe you have mission critical apps. Well, the internet doesn't have a service level agreement, so it doesn't cost us anything and it doesn't take time to get provisioned, but there's no guarantees. If you require guarantees, for your site-to-site -site traffic, you might be more interested in a scenario such as a multi-protocol label switching or MPLS. Um, there's a style of VPN called an MPLS VPN. Just be careful with that term because it eludes that there's privacy, virtual private network, right? It's private from the internet. It's not the public internet, it's a private circuit, but that private circuit has no encryption whatsoever. So the service provider can see everything that you're doing and it's shared with other customers. So what we'll do is we'll lay encryption on top of our MPLS network. So just because you're using MPLS, that gets you your quality of service, which gets you a service level agreement, which gets you a guarantee that says if your connection goes down and you experience a massive business loss and it costs you money, the service provider or the insurance company behind this agreement is gonna pay you out for that loss. You're not gonna get anything like that with, the, with your standard internet connection. Uh, but you're also going from paying hundreds to potentially thousands per month. So just take a look at that, see what works best for you. Um, often it requires high availability and performance guarantees, right? Because we load our VPN up with all of our applications that the employees need for day-to-day -day use. If the VPN goes down, uh, of course, so does productivity. So this is a nice table that shows us some of the differences between different VPN technologies. Where we start off a lot of times is with static crypto maps. Uh, today, as of you know, February 2020, I'd say that this is something that is legacy. Um, and who, people think, ooh, gross, who wants to learn legacy stuff? Well, it's installed everywhere. So it's a good one to know because you're gonna come across it in the field if it's like what we call brownfield deployment. There's already existing uh, equipment out there, a generation or two old, it's trucking along, it works perfectly. We can continue to support it. What we're starting to move towards and away from the static crypto maps and towards this concept of what's called a static virtual tunnel interface is the fact that by leveraging a, a VTI, in, just imagine interface tunnel zero, we move it from GRE to IPsec, and now we'll go ahead and just treat it as a separate interface. That allows us to build all sorts of cool policies on that tunnel interface that are separate from our physical public interface. Historically, with the crypto map, this went on the physical interface. So you had one set of QoS rules that applied to all traffic. Here, we get a dedicated virtual interface just for our VPN traffic, uh, just for IPsec. So really, really nice to have that. Now, ideally, if you're trying to do something where you'd want full mesh, but you don't want the requirements, the headache of all the management, we can leverage dynamic multipoint VPN. Really, really smart. Uh, it leverages the hub to do lookups for network information at the other hosts and can dynamically create spoke to spoke tunnels. So this is almost like full mesh on demand. Very cool. Um, Flex VPN is a new uh, kind of broad term, or uh, let's call it a broad term, that takes all the different styles of configuration, things we used on VTIs, things we used on DMVPN, things that we use on group encrypted transport. This is what we use uh, on top of MPLS. 
And it takes like a lot of these different constructs that we would use to build a, a VPN topology. Site-to-site -site versus remote access, for example, they've got their own uh, sub-configuration details. FlexVPN ties it all together. Ties it all together. So a different format of building the configurations in kind of a simplified logical construction so that we can support lots of types of connectivity uh, with a single configuration set. And this gives us a nice uh, continuation of that table where they show us suitable topologies. So crypto maps, VTIs, these are great for point to point. Once you start going hub and spoke or full mesh, we start moving across this table to the right. Um, suitable for transport, you know, a lot of these we build across the internet. GetVPN was really intended uh, for MPLS. When we take a look at the availability, where do we use these things? Well, this is where it's supported. You see, iOS is the king of site-to-site -site connectivity. The firewalls can do site-to-site -site connectivity pretty good, and then they're really good for remote access. So say the firewalls are the king of remote access, where the routers are the king of site-to-site. -site. You'll get greater control, greater capability uh, on routers in terms of being able to apply QoS, being able to leverage uh, virtual um, virtual forwarding tables. We've got a lot of neat capabilities with the router. Um, very, very slick. 